Okay. Yep. Dean, we gotta we gotta carry it along. Dean, what's your number seven? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um uh number seven I talked about a couple of weeks ago, uh so I'll try and keep it short, but uh <clears throat> is <clears throat> uh one of my favorite uh foreign language films of the year. Uh Ruben Oslin's Force Majeure, which uh just uh sort of devastated me with its you know, insight into, you know, uh, responsibility and, and the, the male, uh, the male ego and so forth basically tells the story of a, of a family out on a, on a skiing trip. And, uh, they, uh, the wife and the two kids and the husband are having lunch one day and they almost get engulfed by an avalanche. And, uh, the father runs away from the family and uh, this happens in the first 10 minutes of the movie. So uh, the whole movie is about the reverberations that come from that single act of trying to survive. And, and also, uh, you know, <laughs> it's uh, also a movie about uh, the, you know, the, the troubles in a, uh, in a sort of a very obviously dissolving marriage. I mean, it's mm-hmm. obvious that there's, there's uh, the, the marriage is on the rocks from the very beginning, but, uh just absolutely exciting but in a very unusual sort of laconic kind of way uh it uh it feels like a i don't know it feels like a kind of a cross between maybe a a you know something like an ordinary people along with something like a, a, a Michael Haneke movie if like a Ma- Michael Haneke was doing ordinary people uh but uh <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I I really love the I love the film I I uh, and it goes some surprising places it keeps surprising you right to the very very end uh, and uh, uh, I I love the two leads Lisa Love and Consley and and Johannes Bach Hunky uh, as the uh, wife and husband and the kids the kids are great in it and. Great cinematography by Frederick Wenzel, and uh, just absolutely stunning on on all levels. So number seven is Force Majeure. Okay, uh, we'll be talking Great about movie. this again. J- J- Jerry, what's your number seven? Um, my number seven is Obvious Child, um, which mm. I really liked a lot. Uh, I know I've spoken about it on the show, so I will try to keep this brief. I'm, I'm pretty good at that, kind of, because um, I just like to rush through everything. Um, I think this is just um, a just breakout performance from Jenny Slate. And, I, you know, the obvious thing is, oh, it's the abortion comedy. I think you're selling it short when you describe it that way. It's more I, than I think that, that, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's what it shows you is how an artist takes, like, their lowest points of their life to make their art. And she's a stand-up comedian. And it is great to watch her do stand-up. It's one of the two movies that we've seen in, in 2014 where the main characters are, are do stand-up comedy, and they're the best parts in the movie. The other movie I'm talking about is Chris Rock in Top 5. Um, when he does stand-up, it's a, it's a, it's a cathartic um, experience, and it's the same way here. But her performance is just out of this world. I only vaguely know her from SNL, which she was fired from for um, cursing on the on live television. If, that, if That's why she was let go, wasn't it? Because she... Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so this movie feels like sweet revenge for her um, in many ways, because and she just commands the screen when she's when she's on there, and it's just a really great love story. It's a really great mm-hmm. realistic love story, and how we just and how we as artists um, go to our lowest points and create some of the best work of our lives. And mm-hmm. I really just felt it was a you know it's a common theme. It's actually a theme in some of the movies that I like this year of. Um, to really, re, for lack of a better word, be reborn. Um, mm-hmm. And I really just thought it was incredibly well done. And I really have, I mean, it's a shame. We had mentioned this a couple of weeks ago that you would be really bold to have nominated her for Best Oscar. It would have been, you know, that would have been a really great, you know, choice, a bold choice. And, and I do want to say this. We talk about the dearth of female performances. There are a lot of great actress performances this year. They're not in mainstream movies, but they're there. This yeah, and they're not Oscar-y kind of movies, but right. uh, but there are a lot of them. Yeah, right. So, yeah, 
That was, uh, I mean, I, the, my biggest complaint with Obvious Child was, and it's just a personal preference for me, but I just felt it was a little too, uh, a little too, uh, uh, I don't know, vulgar, I guess. <laughs> I mean, okay, no, 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 it is. It is. It, it's a bit, I mean, it's a, it's ugly, a movie that doesn't function. shy away from, from fart and pee jokes. So, uh, I, I, I give you that. No, 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 of course. No, but, I mean, that's it. But I like her, and I and I like how you're how you're framing it as a as a as a movie. Uh, the way that you're framing it, it's true that that it is about you know transforming uh, your terrible uh, events in your life into into something something golden. Right. So exactly. In that way, it does work. My uh, okay. So Jerry's number seven is Obvious Child. My number seven is a great little uh, romance. Uh, not really romance. It's just it's one of those feel good about life kind of movies that isn't maudlin or uh, doesn't make you uh, go into diabetic shock. It feels real and true, and I always appreciate movies like that. And that's Begin Again. I tell you, oh, I love that movie. The one thing, yeah. the one sequence in that movie that I love the most is when he, uh, Mark Ruffalo, uh, a music uh, record producer, he's down on his luck, he's broke, and he stumbles upon this great reluctant talent, and he wants to take her under his wing. And they both kind of enjoy this rebirth within themselves throughout mm-hmm. their creative collaboration. That's the essential plot line. But the scene that I really love is when he first sees her performing on stage and she's just performing by herself an acoustic guitar singing a song that she wrote. And in his mind, him being the, a producer, he starts to hear layers upon layer of other orchestration like surrounding her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that one scene uh, did for me what countless musical biopics do, do not, whether you're talking about The Doors or any other biopics that I'm not crazy about. It shows you the creative process and of, it, how music is is placed, uh, how it's arranged together creatively uh, in a completely new and exciting way that movie shows that to you in that one sequence. That's just one of the things that I really admired about it. Mark Ruffalo, I, I, I love him more and more the more I see him. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Keira Knightley is very good. Uh, she she reminds me of a female Steve Buscemi with those teeth. But she's uh, – <laughs> I'll cut that part out. I'll cut that out. That's not right. Uh, no, it's not right. But I, I just say it, it's one of those. It's one of those great, good feeling movies that, and, and it's and it's earned. It's not. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not the sentimentality that you uh, resist or resent. I, I guess is what yeah. I'm it saying. doesn't feel phony, and uh, no. and it is. It is incredibly like wonderfully breezy. It has great yeah. music in it too, which uh, it does. Which also. And the, the, the original songs yeah. are so good, and and they're so expressive of the characters mm-hmm. and where they are in the movie. Mm-hmm. No, it's it, a great, it, great film. It's true. It's true. Well, and I and uh, yeah, it. yeah, I, I totally picked this movie because I loved it. I love it a lot. I know a lot of people like this, this the the movie before this once a lot more, but I actually think it's a lot better than once personally. That's just me. Um, but I like it better than one as well. Once as well. Uh, yeah. I just I, 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 never, I, I never saw once. I gotta admit, but uh, oh, you yeah. should see it. It's, it's definitely worthwhile checking out. But I just thought this was so much better. Um, so, so Dean, you're number six, my friend. Well, uh, very much in the <clears throat> in the wheelhouse of what you were just speaking about. My number six is also a music movie, and it's Damien Chazelle's Whiplash, which. I would, you know, I was discussing this with a friend, Jason Miller, uh, and uh, he he broke it to me. He said I just didn't get with it. I, I just couldn't. I couldn't. I didn't love it because uh, I saw through all of all of the uh, constructs in it, and and uh, and I felt that it it wasn't very realistic. Uh, but for me, what? watching watching the film, 
it didn't really, <clears throat> it's not a terrifically original movie because it's really kind of a, basically a kind of a, a mix of like a military movie with something like fame or something like that. Uh, but, uh, like but, that. As far as it, but as far as it goes, like while you're watching it, it's just ridiculously entertaining. Like it's just every single craft element is, is hitting, you know, I mean the music and the editing and the, Cinematography, especially the editing. I think the editing is amazing. Uh, and I think that Chazelle's camera is exactly at the place it should be at every moment. And and of course, you know the great cast, which is really led by, you know, it's really just Miles Teller and J.K. Mm-hmm. Simmons and a little bit of Paul Reiser and the girl in it, uh, uh, who was very good in it. Um, but. Uh, uh, it's just a, you know, and of course Teller and Simmons, or uh, particularly J.K. Simmons, who just, you know, just owns the role from the very beginning. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, th- those two, uh, those two performances in it are just really what carry you through. And I just, you know, I, I do realize that there are some things in it, like you know, that that re- really wouldn't happen in real life. Uh, but that's okay because yeah. for me, I was just carried away by the movie, and I want movies to carry me away and to not and to, to take me. A, you know, we always talk about escapism and so forth, and I feel like this movie, this movie, uh, did that for me, but without yeah. uh, without a completely forsaking well, you know heart you know, and. In- you know, Jurassic Park wouldn't happen in real life, but but you know, does it feel true to the story they're telling? I mean, is it is it in, is it engrossing? Does it feel uh, does it feel like it's in, in, in line with what these characters would do? And it does in Whiplash. I mean, look, I watched Whiplash and I thought I would never be this kid. I would never stand for this. Yeah. But you know, the movie uh-huh. isn't about me. I'm not the one playing the kid. There are right. some people. Yeah. There are some people that would put up with it. Yeah. Uh, and this kid and is one I, of them. And I do believe I, I, uh, you know, in in debating this with Jason, I said, you know, it's possible that there is a, uh, there are uh, music instructors out there that are slapping some of their students. It's possible. Sure. I had a I had a uh, PE coach that did it, and and this was during the time period of time in the eighties, where you know you didn't report crap like that, you know, right, like, right. like it, you know. Look, yeah, I mean, so uh, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, my uh, you know, anyway, it's it's not it's not worth worth me talking about the things that I I didn't believe in it because. While I was watching it, it totally got me. It totally got me from beginning yeah. to end. You believe and in my the reality heart was of the racing. Movie. Yeah. Yes. yes. My okay. heart was uh, racing, well, and to yeah. me, to me, that's a sign of a great filmmaker. Is somebody yeah. that can uh, overcome those things and just totally. It's like a, It's like you know, play. It, it's a little bit like playing a trick on your audience a little bit, but right. tricking them through the through your craft. Well, well, we're going to talk. We're so, going to talk more about it in a little bit. Uh, so, yeah. Jerry, what's your number six? Okay. Um, let me just say, my number six would be The Rover with Guy Pearce. Mm. That is my. Um, I actually, you know, I was thinking this morning. I wanted to do this by if we didn't pick this movie, what was the movie where I think we would have picked instead? Um, so if I didn't, if The Rover had not come out, I would have put Dawn on the Planet of the Apes. But I'm going to pick go with The Rover because The Rover really struck me. But you had to sit through the whole thing. For, to really get to what is this guy's attachment to this car? Why is Guy here so intent um, to get this nondescript car back in what is obviously post-apocalyptic Australia? And I don't know if post-apocalyptic is the right word to use. We know that society has broken down. Some kind of mm-hmm. economic calamity has affected the whole world. But he, Yeah, we don't want to he, make it sound like a science fiction movie or anything, because <laughs> it's not. It's really not. It's really just that's that's the beauty of it. I think that's really the beauty. That's what I always thought was the beauty of the first Mad Max movie. This society has broken down, and and it's kind of owes to that. This is by David Machard, who also did a wonderful movie a couple of years ago, Animal Kingdom, a great Australian crime um, movie, and and he really um, improves on his um, brand, if that's what you want to call it. Here, he, he is definitely a filmmaker to watch. But he also, the other revelation is so was Robert Pattinson, yes, the Twilight guy, um, playing, you know, his um, character. He's one of these um, stooges, um, criminals, 
that you know is responsible for the you know, who works with the guys who steal the car, and so he takes um, that characteristic Robert Pattinson with him to go find it. And the journey that they take is um, really just very enthralling, very exciting. Um, and I would say this probably brought you know between this and what was the other uh, Cosmopolis, I thought Robert Pattinson is actually showing himself to actually be a, you know at least at least the ability to choose interesting projects. Um, you know, you know, I will not- say that I'm I'm really even if I don't like the quality of all the films they do, I'm really encouraged by the choices that Pattinson and Kristen Stewart have made post Twilight. It seems like yeah, they've yeah. really it's taken incredible. advantage of the currency of being in that series to do, mm-hmm. to do some good good interesting things. But yeah, and to work with some interesting directors, it's true. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but you got to hit at the guy Pierce because he's another one that doesn't go for the easy um, one. Love he's guy Pierce, yeah. And he's really, it's a, it's a powerhouse performance by him. And and when you really see the reason why he, his attachment to this car, I, I found it heartbreaking. Um, but I just, and I've talked about the movie before, so it's not, I don't want to say anything else, but I really thought it was one of the best. Okay, so your six is the rover. Mm. Uh, my six is, is force majeure. So since we've already talked about this, I just want to bring up a, just a couple of very quick things. Um, it's such a relief to see a very intense, uh, intimate, very detailed and observant uh, character study. Um, because, I mean, the, 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 the husband fails to protect his children or his wife uh, during a potential avalanche everybody comes out mm-hmm. unscathed but it uh, it exposes kind of weaknesses and cracks in him and in his marriage mm-hmm. this act of selfishness uh i thought the movie took that intriguing premise and uh went at it like surgery for mm-hmm. 2 hours and uh it's you know it's a movie about people uh and you never know what's going to happen next. And it also struck me as a movie that Stanley Kubrick would have loved. Not only oh, yeah. because it not only because it uses um classical music, like the same classical music cue all the way through it, but uh be, because it is about the the darker side and it just nips at it, nips at it. It's like a it's like a scab that you keep tearing off from your body. Uh, and it also struck me as the kind of movie that could have easily been a comedy as well. It kind of mm-hmm. accentuated the thin line between comedy and drama, because I could see this guy failing to come through for his family, and the rest of the movie he's trying to do something heroic to prove to his family right, that right. He's, he's the man. And there's also like when they involve other people in it, there's the most awkward dinner party ever in the movie. You know? <laughs> oh God! Uh, oh my God! That, that dinner cool. party sequence is great. Oh my God! I mean, so, I mean, so it is. Right. There are some scenes in it that uh, that could have easily fit into a comedy, but and and also, I mean, everything in the movie pulls out the most of its themes. I mean, I, I was struck by all the way during the movie, there are these many controlled explosions going off, mm-hmm. and uh, which mirrors beautifully what that relationship is going. Right. Going yeah. So. Uh, I thought so well done, and 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 it should have been nominated. I, I haven't seen the other four nominees in foreign film, but I mean this had to have been one of the top five best of the year, I would think. But I was shocked I, by I, that actually. I can't explain how it got left off. It's just uh, just ridiculous. I was shocked but, that it didn't get nominated. Yeah, me too. Dean, what is your okay. number five? Number five is a movie that I saw at the uh, Massachusetts Independent Film Festival, and and this year on my top thirty list, which will be uh, drop on uh, uh, filmicability.blogspot.com. Uh, you know, uh, I decided to uh, include movies that you know weren't necessarily released wide this year, things that I'd seen at film festivals and so forth, and. Uh, and the best film, the non-release film of the year, uh, is a film from Canada. It's by Raymond St. John, and it's called A Chair Fit for an Angel. And it's a documentary about uh, the Shakers, the uh, the um, sort of 
18th century English uh, religious community that uh, has its own kind of uh, music, its own kind of craft, its own sort of way of uh, expressing their faith through uh, perfection of their uh, architecture and their uh, furniture and um, and their and their uh, music, which uh, takes kind of center stage here. Uh, the music is almost sounds like medieval music, and it's uh, it's lar- it's uh, acapella. And the movie has a sort of a dichotomous presence in the fact that. Uh, it has uh, uh, a Finnish choreographer named Taro Sarinian, uh who had traveled the world uh, with this show of modern dance set to this uh, shaker music. Uh, the modern dance takes center, center stage in it as well, and so there's there's scenes of great modern dance that is not shaker uh, oriented really, but it's kind of it kind of gets the feeling of uh of uh, of the music uh right and so even though it's it's not sh- uh, that that element is not specifically from the shakers it feels right uh, and it feels uh original and different and i think it's also it's great to see dance in film when it's filmed correctly. Like the only other movie that I can really compare this to is maybe uh uh Vin Vender's uh Pina, uh mm. which also does does a lot of the same kind of thing, uses uh uses space and um and movement uh to really uh capture your imagination. And uh and also in this movie too, it's just so beautifully uh Beautifully shot by uh, Jean Francois Lord, uh, just incredible shots. Not only of the dancing, but uh, of the uh, of the singers. Uh, often, sometimes the singers are in the same space where the dancers are. So sometimes you'll cut to a shot of the singer, and the dancers will be in the background, you know, out of focus, uh, and uh, and perfectly cut in, uh, edited together uh, when you cut to them taking center stage so it's just it's a it's a movie that has a certain sense of space and of light and of sound and it's really at the top of the game as far as that goes and plus it's economically it's an economical length it's 75 minutes and it really just puts you into this world that seems completely foreign uh but but uh but completely devoted uh, to a vision of perfection. And so for that reason, uh, Chair Fit for an Angel is number five on my list. It's a really, really great movie. Uh, it actually moved me uh, moved me to tears because it was just so visually beautiful. Okay. So search it out. To that. Yeah. Uh, and what's the filmmaker's name again? Uh, Raymond St. John. Okay. Uh, Jerry, your number five. Uh, my number five is uh, Saint Vincent. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I really, you know, I didn't really go in thinking I would really like this movie, but I was really moved by um, Bill Murray's performance and actually everyone's performance. I think it's the first movie that surprised me that I actually really liked Melissa McCarthy, actually. Mm-hmm. And Naomi really Watts. And Naomi Watts is very good. She's very funny in it. Um, Chris O'Dowd is great as the uh, teacher. I mean, a lot of good stuff, but it's really Bill Murray, and he's really on top of things. And I just love the end where the little boy who's um, played by it, let me get it to find out his name real quick. Um, is it, I want to say Jaden Labier. Does that sound right? Does that sound like his, um, as Oliver? I, I can't remember, but he was very good in it. He's superb. To hold his own with uh, Mr. Murray, that mm-hmm. um that's a, that's not an easy job um but he was very good and i think when we learn about bill murray's character and we learn we find out why he's l- l- like he is it, it's very it, it you know it does tug, tug at the heartstrings but i think it's in a very good way um and i was just very moved by it and but i also mm-hmm. thought it was incredibly funny and it is a great performance by him um a really really strong comedic performance by bill murray and yeah. I, I, we talked about it when it came out, but it just really, 
Great movie. Would this have been, would this have been just in terms of script? Uh, obviously, it's a movie that was tailor made for Murray, and I mean, mm-hmm. he wanted Murray come hell or high water. But yeah. Would the script have stood on its own without Murray? I don't know. That's a very good. That's a very good question. Um, but it's you know I love Bill Murray for so long, and you know not all you know there's some there's some movies there that are just god awful. Um, that he's made. You know, not everything he makes is good. There's some really bad movies there. Um, no, but this is a good showcase this, for him. I mean, yeah. This is it a was. really good, a really good showcase for him. And I thought, you know, you feel for him at times, too, because he's really down on his luck. I mean, the, the reverse mortgage isn't where he's spent all the money on the reverse mortgage, and 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 he goes to the track, and he's, you know, if I'm not, it was, is he, is the bookie, that's Terrence Howard, isn't it? Yeah, Terrence yeah. Howard, he was in it. And, <laughs> yeah. I know he didn't have much of a part in it. That's why I say that. Um, you know, it's not a you know, it's a, not a big part. Um, it's he's I don't such remember. an unusual actor. He is such a. I I can't think of another actor that's called upon to play menacing roles with such a high voice. Like I, he's just, <laughs> it's just unusual. <laughs> he's just an unusual presence. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. But I really I really liked it. I really enjoyed it. Okay, Saint Vincent is your number five. My mm-hmm. number five was the other feel great movie of the year, and that is Chef. Uh, I mean, who could resist Chef? It reminded me of the very best kind of Cameron Crowe movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. They, they make you feel good about being a, a, a human being. <laughs> we'll be talking about this again later. But, I mean, uh, yeah, and we've talked about it ad nauseum. Uh, so before too, <laughs> because we've been playing this up all year. It, it, it is. It is a truly. Truly enjoyable, delightful, just mm-hmm. infectious movie. That movie had me like walking on air after I saw it. It really did. So. Oh yeah. Oh, without a doubt. So uh, it's very sweet and kind of kind of a brave movie too, in a way, because it's a movie that kind of forsakes when it gets to where it's going. Uh, in the middle of it, it kind of forsakes having any kind of plot uh, uh, revelations. Yeah. And it just it just says, okay, now we're just going to experience what they're experiencing. Yeah, uh, and, and that was it doesn't it doesn't try and try and uh, and overplot things. So, uh, and I thought that, that was a brave choice. Mm-hmm. And and it is a very very sweet, uh, lovable movie. So, so Dean, you're number four. Well, also on the tip of a sweet, lovable movie. This was the movie of the year for me in terms of that. And it comes from Sweden. It's the second Swedish movie on my top ten list, which they're having a great year. Uh, it's Lucas Moodison's We Are the Best, uh, which uh, is also another music movie, the third music movie on my list, if you want to include Chair, with, uh, Chair Fit for an Angel. It tells the story of uh, three um, Swedish girls who decide it's it's 1984, punk is dead, but they decide that they want to start a punk band, and they kind of do it on kind of a uh, it's almost like a dare or something for them. Yeah. But, uh, uh They they do it because they want to get back at a certain group of guys in the school mm-hmm. that they're in and and uh and they kind of do it like they really it, it really is the DIY ethic on film because they're just like well we've never played these instruments before and they just pick it up and 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 go with it and um it was just such a great movie about friendship too uh I I love that it was uh, about, you know, girls' friendships as well, mm-hmm. uh, which we don't see in movies very often, young girls. And I, I thought the three leads were terrific in it. I thought the song that they do, <clears throat> the song that they do <clears throat> called Hate the Sport, which is sort of their <laughs> anthem, is probably the song of the year. Uh, and I just was taken over by the excitement in the movie and the sort of and the and just the the great feeling that it, it left me with uh and it just made me it was just a movie that just made me incredibly happy um and uh uh for that reason it's number 4 on my list it was just i i, I can't recommend it highly enough oh I mean, it's a great movie 
oh, it's it so funny, and it's so it's sweet, but it's funny. But I, I just the the main character, is, I get is so funny and so yeah. cunning and so resourceful. But I love when they get the the very religious girl to join the band. Uh-huh. And from that point on, the movie takes it up a lot. It is, it is a very funny movie. I could not stop laughing. When they cut her hair, oh, my God. <laughs> and that was a great scene. <laughs> that was a great scene. I love I that mean, scene. Uh, it was just it, – it, it, it just felt incredibly real, uh, and uh, it was never maudlin, and, but it always stayed tough. <laughs> and – uh, and I liked also that it, it brought in sort of typical sort of kind of uh, rivalries that might pop up in, mm-hmm. in a band, you know, like oh, rivalries yeah. over romantic rivalries and so forth that were done in a very, very gentle way uh, that, that uh, I don't know, it, it got also, it's also a movie that got what it's like to be in a band, uh, honestly, uh, I gotta like, say it's the best punk rock movie that's been made in a long time. I yeah, mean, really, just. But I also like the bus ride home at the end. Oh yeah, that's yes. hilarious because the, <laughs> it was great, great. It's, it's a great very good final movie. scene. Yeah. yeah, very very great. Okay, so, so you're number, you're number four as we are the best, My Jerry. Four, you're number. Okay, my number four is Snowpiercer. Mm. I had to pick this um, for if no other reason that we we had talked about it. We did talk about this, didn't we? Please tell me we talked about it. Yeah, so, so I, I think we we've, we've talked about Snowpiercer. Okay, yeah. we have talked. Um, I I, I picked this because I really like the director a lot because I love the host, I love Memories of Murder, and I love Mother, but I also like that. He's another director, kind of, who has made some different, very different kind of movies. Um, but I like for his his mainstream English language debut, he gets some really great performances, especially out of Tilda Swinton, um, but also Chris Evans and Jamie Bell. Um, there's some other performances I don't want to give them away. Um, it's also written, if I'm not mistaken, one of the screenplay credits goes to Kelly Masterson, who we've had on the show. Yeah, that's right. She did. Uh, yeah. If she's the same one that did, uh, uh, he, he, did, uh, he, did, he, he did before he. the devil knows you're oh, dead. Oh, yeah. oh, he. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> we've had Kelly Masters on our show. Um, long you know what? I when... think I made that mistake when I introduced because that's back when we did live interviews, and I think I made the mistake of referring to him as a she in my interview. Yeah, no, no, yeah. <laughs> he is very. He's a yeah, very I... bright guy. But... No, but he was great. He said that happens all the time. Like, Sidney mm. Lumet thought that I was a she, like, uh, <laughs> when we first started the movie. So, <laughs> um, I like this film for a number of reasons. Um, obviously, for the same reasons I do like Interstellar. And if this movie had not come out, then I might have put Interstellar in its place. But as it is, I think Snowpiercer is actually the better, the better and bolder film. But they both deserve mention, I think, in the way that they at least are willing to admit that we have a problem. And this movie does tackle um, global warming and one of the ways that we're climate change or one of the ways that they try to solve it, which backfires horribly, and you are stuck on this train that goes, you know, it just keeps going and going and going. Um, I also put this film on here, and I will admit it, the same way I sort of defended Richard Kelly's The Box, which is, in hindsight, probably not the greatest film in the world um, <laughs> many years ago. But I, I, I want to say what? After I saw this, a lot of local actors on, that I'm friends with on Facebook started really ribbing the film, ribbing Chris Evans' performance and everything. And that really sort of irked Because I thought, you know, Chris Evans was doing something a little different, not Captain America, not a comic. It was just something, you know, as a lead performance. And they were making fun of some of his scenes and everything. And I actually thought he was really good in the movie. I thought he was really, really good. Um, as I did, I thought everyone was very good, but I just, I, it's a bold film. It's a film that's tackling something that we can't even get a consensus that's going on in this, in this country right now. That is, mm-hmm. and I just appreciate it for at least being out there. Science, you know, because before this, the only climate movie we have was a day after tomorrow. Okay. If, if I have to really just be blunt, that's what we have the day after tomorrow. As well, far as the I narrative like- goes. 
I have to say too that the movie is great too because it uh, it doesn't just tackle that, but it also tackles the sort of income inequality thing. Oh, I, think even I was, was going to get to that. I was going to get to that. So yeah, that's that's really that's really where it's at. I think. I think the I think the climate change thing is is kind of almost a side thing, and, and but it's no, really it a, a side thing. Let me let's talk about that. We don't even want to have that discussion in this country. We really yeah. don't even want to. We we do, but we don't. There are people who won't even. But it, it, we have to have this. It, it, that's one of the things that's really great, and and it also it doesn't really provide a solution, unfortunately. But it can't, given given the story. But no, that's the other thing. We these are this is a movie that actually like the great, really great '70s sci-fi movies was willing mm-hmm. to address real yeah. problems. And That's true. I love that. I love that you're like uh, putting it in with those '70s sci-fi movies, like you know, like Toilet Green or something like that. Which mm-hmm. is it really, it really is kind of part of that, uh, or, or Logan's Run or something. It's like it really is part of that kind of tradition in, in a yeah, lot of I mean, ways. I, I just, I, I just think it needs to be mentioned because you know, I sometimes think you know, with these lists, we have an opportunity to. You know, of course, the movies that we love and, and some of the bigger movies, but I think so far what I'm noticing with our list is we're really mentioning movies that weren't, you know, you know, mentioned, you know, haven't, and especially at the end of the year, well, have not been Well, I mean, you're, 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 you're talking about issues like in, income inequality and climate change that are hard to dramatize without being preachy. So I, I think uh, allegory is the best way to get around that. Yeah, allegory, mm-hmm. yeah, I agree. Okay, yeah. so your number your number four is Snowpiercer. My oh, we're on to me now, right? Uh, my yeah, mm-hmm. yes, you. number four is uh, this year's biggest Oscar snub, according to the general public. <laughs> my number four is Selma. Let me tell you why I like Selma. Uh, first of all, just like Kill the Messenger, but even more so, I think that Selma is is something we all need to see today. Mm-hmm. Especially with current events this year, it, it's very illuminating in terms of, you know, obviously what they're fighting for, but how they went about fighting for it, and just the particulars of a march, setting up a march, uh, mm-hmm. the 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 goal being just to get across that bridge. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and and it kind of looks at that very minutely. Uh, that that was eye opening to me, and I don't think it's really been done much better in a, in a long, long while. Um, there is a criticism that I do agree with uh, that I saw that Aaron brought up. He had a problem with the way Malcolm X was portrayed in mm-hmm. one scene that one scene that Malcolm X appears in. Right. I didn't have a problem with that at all. I thought actually that that kind of showed that Malcolm felt like he was reaching his end and just as in Spike Lee's biopic he was he was softening and expanding his his reach towards the mm-hmm. end and I thought that he realized that Selma was a culmination of of really accomplishing something the thing that I do think is a fault that I agree with Aaron on is how his, how Malcolm X's uh, murder was handled. I don't think it should have been dramatized because it's been dramatized in a lot of movies. You can't do it better than Spike Lee did it. Right. Yeah. But I do think I do think that the it, the movie should have allowed King a reaction to it. Yeah. Um, because it yeah. kind of goes by in passing in in a speech that King makes. That's uh, true. I, I was amazed by uh, Oyelowo, uh, yeah. especially if you see him in interviews. And he did another movie this year. What was the other movie that he was in this year that I just he saw? Was in, uh, a most he, was, uh, he was in Most Violent Year. Yeah, yeah. I remember right, he was in that, yeah. I mean, where did Dr. King come from within him? And yeah. uh, <laughs> he was honestly phenomenal in this movie. But I he thought was. just in, ter- in terms of... You know, this was a, a seismic moment. This was a time in American history where th- what they were protesting, what they were marching for, really mattered. And this is how they did it. Mm-hmm. And these were these were the step by step. Now, the other big controversy with the movie is the LBJ portrayal, which I mm-hmm. also think is a bunch of hogwash, because I thought that it was. Uh, Empathetic to a point with LBJ, mm-hmm. he came off like a reluctant hero. 
He is that, a politician. He is a politician. Why would he want to to, to be fully supportive of of the march? And you know, it's right. a political nightmare for yeah. him. But he had to be taken to a point where he realized, yeah, and it has to happen. The, you know, and, the, and he took a stand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You no, know, and Robert Caro, who has written, who's writing those wonderful biographies on LBJ, probably the foremost expert, has said that they, it's not, you know. The portrayal in the movie is not off the mark. You know, you know, you, you, that criticism. And these people are just the guys that, who work with LBJ and everything, and who are on the staff and are just trying to protect their legacy. You know, they're, that's all they're doing. By the well, way, well, you know, it, did stri- it, it strikes me as one of those last-minute bullshit uh, smear campaigns to hurt yeah. his chance for Oscars. It is. I mean, honestly, exactly that's what, what it is. is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's exactly what it is. I mean, um, but I, I wanted to add something to it, David. Yellow's performance. What I loved about it, that first scene when he's going to get the peace prize, is that for the first time, King is portrayed as a human being with his yeah. interaction with him, and I love that. I love not that a superhero, him. but yeah, an but actual as a human normal being. Man. Yeah. As a, and that's mm. what I like about the whole performance. Yeah, uh, and, just and, a and, man, not yeah. a holiday, not a stamp or whatever. Just a man. And the whole I the whole thing people. about the infi- the infidelity and that I mean that's brought up. Yeah, um, there are a couple of moments that just floored me. Um, I mean, the the march across the bridge floored me, but mm-hmm. also yes, there's a really subtle scene where he. The night before he leaves for Selma, where he calls Mahalia Jackson and he wants her to mm-hmm. sing to him. Oh, that was great! Uh, right? Oh my God, that was what? It, oh, and this is my favorite part of the movie. The young man that's killed in the movie. Um, God, I forget his the name. Priest? The priest, right? No, no, no. The young, the young boy, and the oh, grandfather. No. The grandfather is that. Oh, that was the best scene in the movie. Mm-hmm. That actor. The actor that plays his grandfather. Oh my God, that was the who I felt was a non-actor of the year. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I felt oh like that was, was, he was a non-actor, uh, really. So it was like there, that was there, what, there was there was not a moment in any performance this year that moved me more than he did in that one scene. He that was a great scene, great scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, that movie, that movie was was is very very good and uh it didn't it didn't make my top 30 but it just missed it but uh uh so much better than your average uh sort of civil rights movie because it because it humanizes almost everybody everybody in it uh yeah. i do feel like it falls down a little bit particularly in the in wilkinson's performance of lbj i think is not not the character, but the performance. There's just a there's a certain uh, there's a, there's some kind of disconnect there for me, uh, and so that doesn't really work in it for me. But uh, and I think that's where a lot of the criticism of the movie is coming from. Not that it's not that it's not um, accurate, but but there's something about Wilkinson in it that it's like. Uh, I don't know. It just doesn't. It would have been nice had he been work. allowed more. It would have been nice if he. Maybe this is what you're talking to, talking about. It would have been nice if he had been allowed moments where you saw, look, I want to help you, but I can't. My hands are tied. Yes. You know? That was the. And that was the thing I think that was I mean, missing. Yeah, in it. And uh, his hands were tied. I mean, no doubt. Yeah. And I love. Uh, I love the woman. Uh, is it Carmen Jago who's playing? Uh, uh, playing. Uh, Corinne Scott King, I thought I she think was so. terrific think, yeah. in it, mm-hmm. and uh, so I mean it, it was a it was a very very. I, I was actually surprised at how much I liked it. And so, and, and no, I actually I feel it's like it's a little clunky at the first thirty minutes of it. I think that's why I didn't I didn't really engage with it until uh, about the twenty or twenty five minute mark, and then uh, then I thought it totally had me. Uh, so, but uh, but I mean. Definitely yeah, a, people. Definitely people need to see people it. Need Pe- to see people it. need to see it, and put it in the yeah. context of where they're living today. You know, they right, really I agree. Absolutely. I, I agree with you that. You know what I also just um, love about the film, and the same thing I guess I loved about Twelve Years a Slave. It doesn't feel like an after-school special. Yeah, that's what I really, right. and that's you know very important to talk about um, civil rights films because a lot of them, unfortunately, the made-for-TV ones do have that. Or like the butler, you know. Yeah, the butler. The butler is just 
let's not talk about the butler. Um, <laughs> the, butler the butler seems insulting after you see something like so. Oh yeah, it really yeah. does. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, D- uh, Dean, what is your number three? Are we up to number three? Yes, we are. Number, Good. number three. Good. Well, number three is a movie we've talked about a little bit. I kind of held off on talking about it, but uh, um, Paul Thomas Anderson's Inherent Vice is my number three. I, I just feel like I. Out of all these movies, out of all of my top ten, I think this is the movie that benefits the most from a second viewing and maybe will benefit. I've seen it uh, a second time, uh, and uh, I think it will it will grow uh, as the more you watch it because um, you will be able to see more connections. Uh, the mystery in it becomes clearer uh, where where things are going. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, once you once you watch it a second time and you've already familiarized yourself with the avalanche of characters that are coming at you, and in that is film. A, that is a good word for an avalanche. Of characters. <laughs> it really is. I mean, it's like it's it's overwhelming the number of characters and and each one of them has a scene that's like, wow, that was a great scene, and then you don't see them again. You know, they they're, they're gone. gone. Uh, but uh, I I I love that fact that that it was like a tour through this time period but also i loved that there's this sort of raging kind of undercurrent that goes through it that 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 talks about uh the current you know the 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 kind of uh short short shelf life of this kind of way of living mm-hmm. that uh is is you know it's going to Go by the wayside. So yeah, uh, but uh, I I loved it too because it was just it was re- I thought it was ridiculously funny. Um, I loved it. Uh, I thought when it changes when it changes gears and becomes dramatic, I thought it it, it became very intense and mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, wonderful in that realm as well. Um, I mean, the look of the film, of course, with the Elswitz photography and the the great costume and set design. I was really pleased that it got a costume design nomination. I don't know why, but uh, oh, it deserves uh, it. I mean, yeah, it it does. I, I think the art direction is amazing in it too. But uh, everything is it's it's hippy dippy, yeah. But it's but it keeps it it keeps it a little lower, like it, it, it it's subtler, you know, than the average movie that takes place in this time period. And uh, and I also another thing I liked about it too as a pot smoker myself, I think that it gets the whole idea of 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 uh, pot smoking down, like the sort of the way your mind works mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, under the influence and so forth. And I love how it it's a it basically is like the big sleep. I mean, like that's why at the at the film festival, I asked Paul Thomas Anderson, did you watch The Big Sleep a lot while preparing for this movie? And, of course, he did. Because, you know, with the exception of the presence of pot, uh, which can easily it, – it's just basically like The Big Sleep, but instead of liquor, there's pot, you know, because right, yeah, yeah, I mean, The Big Sleep. So <laughs> – uh, so that's 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 basically what it is. It's just you know, the the sort of wild characters that a PI would come into contact with yeah. in in the course of a case, but, and and I loved its foggy its fogginess. You know, it just yeah. had this sort of foggy quality to it that mm-hmm. I. I I know that there's going to be people who get irritated with it uh, because they can't follow the mystery, but that's just not the point. And uh, and by the way, again, if you watch it a second time, the mystery comes into clearer clearer view, and, right. and you start seeing connections between uh, now that now that the characters have been introduced to you, and you already have a sort of a playlist to work with or, a, a, you know, like a list of characters in your head, you right. can kind of get all of the connections between between things. So, yeah. But also, I should say, just finally, I mean, again, great cast. Phoenix, great. Roland is great. But Catherine Waterston was just, <laughs> just unbelievable. Right. No, no, she and was. Then, she was. 
Martin Short and Joanna Newsom as the as the uh, narrator. She was perfect. And uh, people like Jeannie Berlin and Martin Donovan, who that was my favorite scene in the movie. Uh, yeah. Just, I, I don't know. It's just he continues to be the one of a kind filmmaker that that we deserve. And so that's number three for me. Yeah, no, I, I just want to add two things. The movie's not for everyone. This is not a mainstream film. Not that P.T. Anderson films, for the most part, are all that mainstream. But this one is just, is, while I'm watching, I'm like, you know, this is just not a, this is not a crowd pleaser. Um, this is just not that film. I mean, even amongst Paul Thomas Anderson fans, a lot of them can't, a lot of them can't get on with it, too. Oh, no, no. But, uh, but I, I think they need to... I think they need to realize that, you know, it's not a movie that even if you're a fan of his stuff, and, and I would have said the same thing. Uh, I said the same thing about The Master, too, which got a similar reaction amongst yeah. fans. He's like, not everything. He's not going reaction. to do a movie. <laughs> he's not going to do a movie that you're, you're going to know what you're going to get when you sit down for it. Yeah. It's but the just, other, other thing I just want to say is Joaquin Phoenix's character, Doc. Da, da. Is a really good character. Is a really good person. He's a really good yeah. friend. That yes, he is. really struck me at the end of the movie. He's a really good person. Good person. That struck mm-hmm. me. Really, I yeah. was blown away by that. Yeah, and you don't get that in movies very often either, yeah. especially a movie of this type. So, yeah. uh, so I, I think that's worth worth uh, pointing out as well. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jerry, you're number three. Uh, my number three is talked about a lot. I would just say it's Guardians of the Galaxy. Just a really, you know, of of all the big blockbuster movies this last year, that was the one that was the most... It put fun back in the equation. Um, mm-hmm. and, and it just was a good time. And an unexpected good time, too. But you know, as we said before on the show, James Gunn, who we, we've interviewed in the past, he just knows... He just sort of really got this material, I think, better than a lot of other people. Have gotten. Mm-hmm. They remember what made Iron Man so much fun. They remember what made the original Star Wars film so much fun, and he went with that. And he just, just really, just a great time at the movie. Just a wonderful mm-hmm. time. Okay. And it put seventies seventies music back on the top of the uh, and a great on the top of the Billboard chart. <laughs> great soundtrack. Um, just I gotta soundtrack. love it for that. <laughs> yeah, great movie. Okay, let me type in your. Your choice, Guardians of the Galaxy, because I'm keeping track of everybody's things. So. You're a good man. <laughs> of the galaxy. Okay. My number three is Nightcrawler. Um, love that this was nominated for screenplay for Dan Gilroy. I hate that it wasn't nominated for Best Actor, but... Oh, I hate that, crowded, too. Oh, my crowded God. year. And, and supporting actress, acting, too. <laughs> yeah, but in, in terms of acting... Um, Gyllenhaal truly creates one of the most original characters that I've seen in a while. Uh, it's uh, you know it's his version of Travis Bickle in a way, but um, I, I thought he was really stunning in it. And the movie is it's one of the best looking movies. I mean, for me, oh, this God, is the yeah. LA this is the LA movie of the year for me. Um, so, and uh, we talked about it at length when it first came out, but. Uh, it's another movie where I was on edge, where I was screaming at the characters, you know, don't do that. Where I was curious about where it would go and how far the character would go. Um, I think it has, uh, it, it feels, at one time it feels kind of dated. Uh, and, and in another way it feels like it, it's tackling some issues that we're dealing with head on today uh, about where our priorities are. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just think I thought it was a really stylishly done movie, and the style was in the uh, service of content, uh, which is not a, not something you get a lot with really great great photography. I mean, a lot of times mm-hmm. photography just wants to draw attention to itself, but but this really deepened your investment in the themes and in the story. I thought, and that's what makes it mm-hmm. so great. Mm-hmm. So that's that's my number three, Nightcrawler. Good Incredibly exciting movie. Incredibly exciting. 